We have so far introduced the second law of thermodynamics, which in particular tells us the greatest possible efficiency of a heat engine operating between two temperatures, Th and Tc. But that doesn't solve the problem that we started out with, and that is, what makes certain processes reversible and what makes certain processes irreversible? In other words, how do you figure out the direction of the arrow of time? or in particular, the thermodynamic error of time. We can, of course, judge things from common sense, but scientifically, how does one point at the correct direction of error of time? What is the reason why certain things can only proceed forward, not backward? In other words, why are things irreversible? Well, it turns out, to study this further, we must introduce a key concept, the so-called entropy. Entropy is a quantity that allows one to quantify not just qualify but quantify the degree of disorder or randomness in a system and in doing so we can predict the arrow of time we can point out why things certain things are reversible certain things are irreversible okay let us first derive let us first derive the concept of entropy from thermodynamical point of view and then we can look at the microscopic or statistical root of the concept of entropy. Uh, we start again with a Carnot cycle. As you know, a Carnot cycle is made of two isothermal lines and two adiabatic lines on a PV diagram. We have proven that Q1 over Q2 equals T1 over T2. Uh, here, this first isothermal process, the isothermal expansion is called step one, and this isothermal con contraction is called step two. Q1 over Q2 equals T1 over T2. And we, let me define the sign of Q such that if, a, the, if the system absorbs heat, then we say Q is positive. And if it gives up heat, if it releases heat, then we say Q is negative. So from here to there, of course, it's an isothermal expansion that the heat is being absorbed by the system to Q1 is positive. And from here to there, the uh, system releases heat as it shrinks, and therefore Q2 is negative. Now, we can rewrite this expression by dividing both sides with T1 and moving this Q2 to the other side. And then you, you move both terms to the same side. You get Q1 over T1 minus Q2 over T2 equals 0. These are all absolute values. But since Q1 is greater than 0 and Q2 is less than 0, I can remove both of these absolute signs by changing Q2, the, change the negative sign to a positive sign. Okay? Uh, it's because minus something positive equals adding something negative because Q2 is negative. Now, you also realize that these two other processes, this step and that step, they don't involve any change, any transfer of heat between the system and the environment. So when you have all these four steps, one, two, three, four, you have all these four steps, you'll find that the sum of this quantity Q over T for step for all the four steps should be equal to zero. Okay, of course, in these two steps, there is no Q, so we don't worry about it. In this step, it's Q1 over T1. In that step, it's Q2 over T2. You see the sum indeed equals zero. So there's something interesting about this quantity Q over T. Okay, even though the total, if you add all the all the heats up, okay, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, you find the, the, you know, the sum is not equal to zero, right? But this quantity Q over T the net change of this quantity Q over T over the whole cycle is equal to zero. Now, when the net change of a quantity over a whole cyclic process equals zero, that gives us some hint. It hints that this quantity might actually be what's called a function of state, which means it depends on the state only. And since you go back to the same state after a cyclic process, of course the net change of that quantity is going to be zero. Can you give me an example? Well, how about the internal energy, right? The internal energy from here to there, it's, it stays the same. From here to there, it, it, uh, it of course changes. And then from here to there also changes. But what's the net change internal energy? Well, zero. It's you go back to the same initial place. Okay, so this is the first thing we, kept, we, we keep in mind. Let us keep a close eye at the quantity Q over T. Q is the heat absorbed by the system. T is the temperature of the system. Of course, this only works for the Carnot cycle. It's a re reversible cycle, but it's a special thing. It's a Carnot cycle. What if we're dealing with a non-Carnot cycle? An arbitrary reversible process. 
Okay, it is reversible, but otherwise arbitrary. Something like that. What am I going to do? Well, this is not a Carnot cycle, right? Now, I have a lot of knowledge about Carnot cycle, so what I'm going to do is I am going to look at, see if there's a way I can divide this thing into a whole bunch of Carnot cycles. This does not look even close to a Carnot cycle. However, if you look at a very tiny step from here to there, let's call it step one. Okay. Can we go from this point to that point in isothermal way? Now, if I did that, I probably most likely would go out of the actual curve. The actual curve from here to there is not isothermal. However, since this step and that step are very, very close to each other, it's like uh, I am the actual, let's say the, the actual curve is like this, right? But the, an isothermal curve would be like that. See, there is a difference. But since it is too, it is very, very narrow from here to there. The, this isothermal line and the actual curve are actually very close to each other. Okay? They're very close to each other. So I'm going to go from here to there in the isothermal line, which is not that far from the actual curve, because after all, you know, you go from here to there, the step is too, is, is so small that you don't expect the temperature to change dramatically from here to there anyways. And then once I reach here, let me not follow this path anymore. Let me take a direct adiabatic expansion so that I reach that point. Okay. Once I reach that point, I go up isothermally. Again, very, very narrow. And then I take an adiabatic step and go back to where it came from. In other words, what I have here is a tiny Carnot cycle with very, very short steps for the two isothermal lines. Very short isothermal, very short isothermal. Okay, this of course does not resemble the entire cycle, right? Does not re resemble the entire cycle. But here's what I'm going to do. After going through this, I'm going to do something similar. Okay, I'm going to do this. Again, isothermal, adiabatic, isothermal, adiabatic. And then do this. Let me use a different color. I'm going to do this again. Isothermal, adiabatic, isothermal, adiabatic. You see what I'm what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to divide this arbitrary cycle into a whole bunch of neighboring, very narrow Carnot steps, Carnot cycles. Okay, you have this black one, you have this orange one, you have this green one, and so on. And you can keep on going, keep on doing this. Okay, you can you know you keep on cutting this thing into a whole bunch of Carnot cycles. In doing so, the uh, contour of the actual cycle can be closely mimicked by these isothermal lines. Okay, but what about these intermediate steps, which does not exist in the real cycle? Well, not going to worry about it because you see, for every step going down like this, there is an accompanying step going back up. You see that? This green line going down, and there's, I mean, this orange line going down, this green line going up, this black line going down, and this orange line going up, and so on. Okay, so every step in the middle. All, all the adiabatic lines have been traversed twice, okay? One forward, one backward. So they're going to cancel out. So effectively speaking, this arbitrary reverse, reversible cycle can be broken down into a whole bunch of Carnot cycles, each with tiny, tiny isothermal steps. Okay, let's look at a typical one, this black one. Okay, here is an isothermal expansion, here's an isothermal contraction. In isothermal expansion, the heat absorbed is dq1. The temperature is about T1. Okay. In isothermal contraction, the heat release is DQ2. So DQ2 is actually negative. Divided by temperature, T2. So obviously, since this is a kind of cycle, we have this DQ1 over T1 plus DQ2 over D2 equal to zero. We proved that before. Okay. This is true for this one kind of cycle. But what about the next kind of cycle? Next one, next one. You keep on adding every one up, right? It's just not, not just one and two. You find that for the entire cyclic process, I find DQI over TI equal to zero. This I you know, I could one, two, three, four, five, six, you keep on going, okay? By adding the whole cycle up, you have actually gone around the entire cycle. Of course, in order for these zigzag lines, okay, isothermal, 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 in order for this, these zigzag lines to actually mimic the real smooth line, you want to make sure that these steps are as close to isothermal as possible, which means you want this point to be very close to that point, so close that the temperature between here and there is essentially the same. 
In other words, you want this dq to be extremely small. These are infinitesimally small cycles. If you want these cycles added together to mimic the actual, to resemble the actual step, which means these are infinitesimally dqs, and then I have to replace, of course, I have to replace this summation with an integral sample. Okay, this c is the contour of this uh, of this cycle. It can be any shape I want, any shape I want. This is a contour integral, suggesting, indicating that it is a cyclic process goes back to itself. Okay, so what we have proven here is that the result of the sum over q over t equal to zero over cyclic process can go beyond just a mere Carnot cycle, it can include any cyclic reversible process. Okay, that is this the sum of dq over t over this one whole cycle is always equal to zero regardless of the shape of this contour. Now what does that tell us? It tells us that you take this quantity dq over t, see how it changes. Okay, it turns out no matter how you do it, as long as you go back to yourself, the net change of this quantity dq over t is always equal to zero, whether it's a Carnot cycle or any other cycle we're talking about. Now this tells us something. It tells us this quantity dq over t, just as we suspected. This quantity is not just anything. It is equal to the change, equal to the change in a function s, and that function s is a function of state. Because if it's a function of state, you can rewrite this as ds, right? Okay, look, s is a function of state. So after one complete cycle, S goes back to itself because the state recovers to to the original value, and therefore, you know, this it's natural that this this integral is a, is, a, is equal to zero. So to guarantee that dq over t, the integral is always equal to zero over any cycle. You have to assume that this quantity dq over t equals ds, and here s is some sort of function of state. It is not energy. Okay, it's something different. Now I'm gonna I put. A subscript r in it. What does r suggest here? What does r mean here? It means it's a it's a reversible process. Okay. Why do I have to insist a reversible process? Because each Carnot cycle is reversible, right? If I can break it down to a whole bunch of Carnot cycles, that means this cycle is also reversible. And so, in a reversible process, only in the reversible process, can I equate dq over t with ds. Okay. So this has to be true for a reversible process only. Um, what if the process is irreversible? Okay, let's take a look. If the process is irreversible, then of course the efficiency of that cycle is less than one over one minus t t two over t one because after all, the efficiency is is the greatest for any reversible cycle, right? So that means that for the same dq one, remember uh, for for a Carnot cycle, the thing absorbs heat by an amount dq one and gives up heat heat dq two, right? The difference dq1 dq2 that's the work done right now if the thing has is reversible i'm sorry if the if it's irreversible then the efficiency is lower which means for the same dq and for the same amount of heat absorbed it dumps more heat using less to do work right so for the same dq1 this time dq2 has to be greater it loses more heat it wastes more heat using less to do work that means this dq2 is greater in magnitude than the case before, for, than the case of Carnot cycle for the same dq1. Remember, dq2 is negative, but has a greater absolute value. Okay, you replace this with a greater absolute value with a negative, of course, it's the quantity in, in red is negative, that means the whole thing is less than zero, right? Because it was equal to zero when you had Carnot value of dq2, right? Now you have a greater negative value, of course, it's less than zero. So when you integrate over the whole cycle, you find, of course, this is irreversible, right? It's irreversible process. You find that you get less than zero. Okay, less than zero, not equal to zero. Now, for the Carnot cycle, which is reversible, or actually any reversible cycle, not just Carnot, we just learned that this is equal to zero. Okay, the sum is equal to zero. Okay, and but by the way, for the reversible cycle, this thing also has a name called ds. Okay, now what does that tell us? It tells us that this is greater than that. This is zero, and that is less than zero, right? So ds, which is equal to this, must be greater than this thing, dq irreversible over t. Okay, so this is what happens when you have an irreversible process. If a process, up, uh, during the process, the uh, system absorbs a certain amount of heat, dq, it's irreversible. Then divided by the t temperature t, 
the corresponding change in the quantity s is greater than dq over t. D, ds only equals dq over t if that q, if that dq is absorbed during a reversible process. 